Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, first time using Teams for this, so hopefully it'll all go, go smoothly. Uh, so welcome to the first of our uh, attack detection workshops. Um, we've got some really cool stuff coming up over the next four weeks, so um, lots of demos and stuff, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, we've got a fair bit to go through, so we're going to be going at quite a clip, uh, but just to let everyone know that one, um, there'll be a recording of this sent out afterwards so you can rewind and stop and start and uh, kind of review it as you please. Uh, and then in addition to that, all our demos will have lab guides as well. Um, so those links will be put into the, the chat shortly and they'll be sent out afterwards as well. Um, so you can again look at those, go further with the examples and, and kind of further your understanding and stuff. Um, so without further ado then, let's, uh, let's get started. Cool. So firstly, who, who are we, right? So uh, Ricardo and Karani and myself, uh, I'm AFI Champion. So Ricardo is more involved in the uh, kind of Active Directory uh, Security Review Service. Uh, and then I'm more involved in, in the attack detection or kind of purple team inside of the house. So essentially goals of this, uh, this series. So we're looking to improve understanding of attacks. So this is like the classic offense informs defense type thing. We want to take some offensive tradecraft that we've seen in the real world um, and then we want to understand how that works so we can replay it in a lab environment and then figure out ways or opportunities we have to detect that activity. Um, it isn't going to be an exhaustive look at each attacker technique. Um, we're going to just look at some examples of kind of detection strategies that you could employ um, to detect some of these, these things. If you're interested for kind of further reading, um, I'd highly recommend Jared Atkinson's blogs on um, capability abstraction and the funnel of fidelity. Um, they're really good for understanding kind of the nature of the detections you're building and the pros and cons and kind of where the limitations are. So I'd highly recommend that. Um, and essentially, our hope is that what we show you in the next few weeks is going to be as, as it says there, attack detection fundamentals. So they're going to allow you to understand a bit better how your enterprise products work under the hood. Um, so obviously we're not we're not going to the scale of, of of that level. So we're not talking about you know inclusions of external threat intel and kind of indicators of compromise and stuff, nor data processing and and, and, and analysis. Um, but our hope is that ultimately all of that boils down to some of the key things that we're going to describe in in the next few weeks. Um, so how are we going to do this? Um, essentially, we're going to analyze um, some known TTPs or tactics, techniques and procedures used by real threat actors. We're going to emulate some of those in a controlled lab environment, uh, and then we're going to observe um, the traces they leave and the opportunities that we have uh, to detect them. And we're going to kind of frame some of this with MITRE ATT&CK where we can. So before we jump into the action, then just a bit of an overview of what we're doing here. So it's a very simple lab setup intentionally for the purposes of this lab. Um, so we've got a couple of virtual machines. One, I guess, is the attacker and one is the, is the target machine. Um, and we're going to try and use open source offensive and defensive tools wherever we can. The idea being that, you know, you, you don't need to go out and spend big money on, on a given, you know, hacker tool or whatever it might be to understand more about this stuff. Um, and then, as I said at the start, we're going to provide um, lab scripts for everything we're doing here um, so that you can replay it in your own time. So episode one then, initial access. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, if we look at the MITRE ATT&CK uh, tactic, um, it refers to it as a set of tactics, techniques and procedures, or TTPs as we say, um, that's used by malicious actors to obtain a foothold in the target environment. So that can be any number of things. If you look down that, that vertical column in, in, um, in the MITRE ATT&CK navigator, you'll see everything from spear phishing with attachments and links um, through to compromising a kind of internet facing asset. So we've seen, especially at the turn of the year, things like Citrix and VPN clients that were kind of exposed and, and there were vulnerabilities there that allowed attackers to get a foothold. But for the purposes of this exercise, uh, we're going to be focusing very specifically on malicious documents, so kind of maldocs, techniques that attackers can use to send, for example, office documents or other kind of executables into your environment in the hopes that one of your employees will click on them and then they can obtain the foothold that they need to then proceed down the kill chain. So everything we're going to show you is going to largely fall into one of four categories here. So we're talking about network events, um, we're talking about endpoint logs, so that with regards we've also got Sysmon in, in play here. Um, we're talking about EDR and some of the capabilities that that has. Um, and then lastly, we're looking at host memory. So the last lab here is going to involve um, some memory or forensics. Um, the labs we're going to do, um, so we've got four of them here. 
Um, essentially, the first one um, is a very simple PowerShell one-liner that's been embedded um, in an Excel spreadsheet, and that's going to be using VBA macro um, to execute that. That's then going to pull down a staged payload using Covenant, and Covenant is going to be the first of our open source um, C2 post exploitation frameworks. Um, it's really popular, uh, and hopefully, it'll give you a good idea of kind of what's possible. Our second lab um, is going to involve a malicious HDA file, um, and this is an example of an attacker using a living off the land binary, which we'll come on to later, to essentially achieve the same effect. How do they get a, a foothold there? Uh, and so we're going to be using um, the Coadic framework, again, open source. There'll be links as we go through the slides, so you can see those and look them up in your own time. And then we've got a, a middle lab there, so just like an extended exercise for Operation Cobalt Kitty. So this is what we're going to do is take a Cyber Reason blog is a really extensive overview of exactly how um, that operation took place from an offensive perspective. And we're going to try and emulate that, emulate that right down to the files and the initial access techniques that were used there. And our hope is that, that that third exercise is going to essentially combine the learnings from the first two labs. So you can see all along that chain of, of downloading files, setting scheduled tasks, etc. Um, you can see detection opportunities throughout that. Um, and then lastly, lab three is going to be um, the use of an Excel uh, 4.0 macro that's going to execute some shell code for us. So a bit more of an advanced and low level um, inspection needed there. So we're going to get started then with a PowerShell macro uh, and I'm going to pass over to Ricardo for that. So take it away, Ricardo. Yeah, hi guys. I hope you can hear me right. So in the first lab, what we're going to do is to create a very, very basic VBA payload and we're going to embed that into uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So basically our VBA payload, what it's going to do is ex execute a PowerShell uh, one-liner that's going to fetch a stager from our command and control server. Uh, these are, this is a really simple example, and despite its simplicity, uh, we wanted to analyze that because that's something that was Actively, actively used by real-world actors such as Emotet, uh, for example. So we we think that's still relevant. And for for doing this, we're going to use the um, Covenant C2 framework, as Alpi was saying. Uh, now I hope you can read that. Uh, this is the basic skeleton of the VBA payload that we're going to use. As you can see, it's quite quite simple uh, and the relevant part is the, the, the second line. So call shell, as you can see, it's like a, just invoking a function that's uh, calling PowerShell. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this specific command, uh, the main components are just uh, these two functions. So IWR, uh, which stands for invoke web request, uh, basically what it does, it, it goes to this uh, URL uh, c2.com test.ps1, fetch the content and returns that. The other interesting function is IEX, which stands for Invoke Expression. So what Invoke Expression does is given uh, an input, it treats that input uh, as PowerShell code. So if we combine these two functions, we can re uh, retrieve remote content from our server and then execute it in memory as PowerShell code. Uh, so yes, I can. I think we can jump into the first demo. And see if we can seamlessly transition between. Uh, <laughs> never going to happen. <laughs> so sorry, one sec. Yeah, you should see my screen now. Um, can you see that, Alfie? Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. So this one here is the Covenant uh, management panel. Again, this is an open source framework and using it, it's quite simple. Uh, what we're doing now is creating a listener. Uh, and again, all these steps are going to be documented properly in the lab guide. So just to just to explain you what a listener is, uh, for those who never use the C2 framework, it's basically a component that's listening, uh, as the name implies, on the C2 framework um, and accept connection from the implant that we're going to deploy on in the victim machine. So now that we created a listener, we're going to create launchers. So a launcher is basically another way of, of, of saying implant. So something that it's deployed on a victim machine. So as you can see on the bottom here, uh, 
on the launcher box. There is a really long PowerShell command. And if you execute that command on a Windows box, you're going to obtain a connection back. Um, however, a uh, few details, this specific command uh, embeds the whole Covenant implant. OK, so this is called a stageless payload. Um, and the opposite of stageless is staged. So what a stage is, is just a smaller piece of code. And what it does, it just fetch the remote content and execute in memory. Um, and for this example here, actually, we don't want a stageless payload, but we want a staged one because we're going to embed that into a, a document that's going to be delivered to victims. So size uh, in this case matters. Um, uh, in order to do that, we're going to use the built in a covenant way of doing that. We just selected a file name, and as you can see, now the stager, um, the, sorry, the launcher is a bit different. So it's using, as you can see, the IEX function, and it's downloading content from uh, a remote address. Uh, now, I don't want that form, so I'm going to take the encoded uh, version, the base64 encoded version, just because it's uh, easier to play with uh, using um, quotes and uh, Excel macros. So very easily here, I took the skeleton code that I showed you before, and I just replaced the uh, PowerShell command with the one that Covenant generated for me. So what I'm doing now is just within Excel, put this macro. And the developer tab within Excel, it's not something that you see by default, but like activating it, it's fairly easy. And I mean, you can find lots of tutorials online, but also we're going to um, describe that on the upcoming blog post. Um, so yeah, we just copy the code here and save the file. We have to remember to save the file for the first time um, as Excel with macro enabled workbook, otherwise you're not going to execute. So actually, before executing our payload, uh, we want to clear the event log, so we're not going to see uh, other events, but just the things that are relevant um, to our attack. So now we're just opening the payload, and you, you might recognize the enabled content dialog. Um, we just enable it. Something happened, presumably. And if we go into the event logs, so just to clarify, these are the Sysmon uh, events. Uh, so at the moment, we are concerned with uh, the process creation events, so event ID 1. Uh, however, this is not something Sysmon specific, and you can enable them on natively on Windows with advanced process sorting. So the interesting bit here, obviously, is you can see this uh, really dodgy PowerShell command line. And the interesting part is that the parent image is Excel. So something that normally shouldn't happen. Um, all other things that you might notice. So for example, these registry events, uh, these are generated when you uh, enable content, enab enable macros on an on Excel spreadsheet or or in general in another uh, office product. Uh, if we go back to our command and control framework, we can see that we actually obtained something. And uh, just to verify that we have some level of access, we run the who am I command. Takes a while. And uh, yeah, that's me. Nice. OK, let's see if we can get these slides back. OK, cool. So there's a few kind of headlines there, I suppose. So the first one is going to be that event ID one from Sysmon. So that's where our macro in Excel is then spawning PowerShell to pull down um, the next stage of, of Covenant. Um, we also have the PowerShell code then establishing a network connection. So essentially what you see in there, of course, is that we're pulling down that stage and that's generating the Sysmon event ID three. Um, there's also something that we wasn't discussed there, but there's also the opportunity to detect the PowerShell um, command itself 
Um, so script block logging is a good example of how that could be achieved. Um, I think it was PowerShell 3 and onwards that has the capability to do that. Um, so as an example, if we just um, we just go forward here. So this isn't specifically um, from Ricardo's demonstration. So this is just, I was doing the same thing with a, a Cobalt Strike, so another framework here. Um, and you can see very similar traits here. So it's a 4104 event from PowerShell or for script block logging. Um, and you can just see within that the download string, the IEX command that we've mentioned before, and then it's just pulling down that file um, from, my, from my local machine. Um, and there's obviously other things there from a preventative standpoint. So when it comes to things like constrained language mode that could make that, that more difficult for an attacker, but we won't go into too much detail there. The main thing to take from it really um, is that parent-child process analysis or process ancestry. Um, so it's a good opportunity to look for anomalous processes um, that are being, are being spawned from um, your Microsoft Office products. It doesn't have to be PowerShell necessarily, but obviously that's what we've used in this example. Um, as we'll see later on in this workshop, but there's other examples of um, living off the of land binaries or lulbins that we can use um, to achieve very similar effects. And I just had a quick glance actually into the, uh, the Q&A and I saw a question that I hope this will address slightly. Um, and that's kind of, it, this obviously isn't job done from a defensive standpoint. So there are a number of different ways to um, essentially decouple the execution of your malicious program from the parent that's, that's, that spawned it. So how do we take our PowerShell away from, from Excel if we were, you know, wanted to use PowerShell? Well, a few examples include um, WMI or use of WMI. So that's Windows Management Instrumentation. Um, the second, which we'll cover, on a, cover off in a sec, is use of COM objects. Uh, and the third is parent peer spoofing, which, as it as it probably sounds, is a way to spoof um, the process ID and uh, that that child process born from. Um, but if we just dive into um, com objects for a sec, um, so this essentially is a way. Um, well, com is a way for processes to interact with each other and execute commands or methods um, that they wish to expose. So what you can see here in the bottom left. Um, is a VBA snippet. So essentially very similar to the commands that you saw Ricardo copy and pasting into his, his VBA macro in Excel. You can use something similar to this. So this uses a GUID as a reference. So you can see there with the number, the kind of the, the ID that starts with C0AA is essentially the GUID um, for shell browser window. And this is one of the many objects that allows um, for command execution. So if we kind of walk down that nested method, you can see the line below. So object.document.application.shellexecute, that shell execute method basically takes the argument, as you can see there, and will just spawn, um, in this case, calculator for us. We look over on the right, you can see, similar as we did before in event ID one, um, but we now have our, in this case, completely benign calculator spawning from Explorer, which obviously um, isn't the Excel um, process that we were looking for before. Um, if we progress then, something slightly different then. So we're going to use, as I mentioned at the start, we're going to use Coadic, another um, open source um, framework, um, and that's going to be using a HDA file. So I'll pass back over to, to Ricardo to talk through how that's going to work. Yeah, so as Alfie was saying, basically what we're going to do is use an HTA file to spawn a Coadic implant. Uh, so what is an HTA file? So HTA stands for Microsoft HTML application, and it's just a way uh, of writing HTML code. However, without the uh, restrictions of the Internet Explorer sandbox. So effectively, you can execute OS commands using HTA file. Um, uh, so, for example, you can use JavaScript within those H HTA files, uh, and that's what we're going to see actually. Uh, the, the interesting bit from the user perspective is just to execute code, the user just needs to double click on them. Um, so it's quite similar to a standard um, exe type of file. Uh, so for doing this, we're going to use, as I said, Coadic and Coadic is an open source framework. And on a, an interesting note, this has been used uh, by APT28 during their real life operation. So this is not just uh, a toy. Um, so Coadic is this post exploitation framework and it heavily relies on COM objects for doing different things like code execution, lateral movement, and privilege escalation. Uh, what we're interested in is that Quadic is able to generate stagers uh, in the HTA format straight out, out the box. So let's jump 
on the demo if we can. So you should see something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So perfect. So what we did is just starting Coadic, and again, maybe some people are not familiar with this type of things. Uh, we try to document as much as possible every single step needed to do this. Uh, so the only thing that we really need to do, so the default stager of Coadic is um, an HTA file. So that's exactly what we want. So the, the first command that we issue, the set a server host, it, it, it needs to be, uh, so that's the IP address of my command and control server. And with the execute command, we generate the stager. So as you can see, uh, the generated stager is in the form MSHTA and then this URL, which is my command and control server. Uh, so MSHTA, it's the default Windows binary that launch HTA files. So when you double click an HTA file, under the hood, MSHTA it's called and it's going to take as an input that file that you just executed. Uh, however, so if you ex execute this command on a compromised Windows box, you're going to obtain a connection back. However, However, that's not something we want because we want the raw HTA file because we want to deliver that to the victims. So what we're doing here is just download the HTA file on our testing box and later we're going to move into the victim machine. So just to show you how does it look like. It's a bit strange, but I mean, if you're familiar with HTML, you, you see that it's it's HTML, it's just a little bit harder to read because it, it has some layer of obfuscation already built in into the framework. OK, so we are on the victim box and we're go going to double click on test HTA and yeah, <laughs> uh, done. We already have a connection. I so, love how you're surprised that you got a show in a video. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I know it's always fantastic. Uh, so what's happening here? Uh, I use the command zombies. So zombies, it's just the quadic specific terms for describing implants. So while Covenant had grunts and Cobalt Strike has beacons, quadic uh, had zombies. Uh, um, so the thing that we're doing now is use the sim very simple exec command module to execute the host name command on the compromised machine. And as you can see, we obtain the result, which is commando, and that's the host name of my machine. And as we did previously, we're going to analyze the Windows event logs to see what happened. But now we're not going we're not going to be interested just in process creation, but also networking related events. And within Sysmon, uh, this is event ID number three. And the cool thing about Sysmon is that you can see network uh, address, but also the binary that generated that event. So we're just filtering the current events. And we're going to look specifically for MSHTA. Again, MSHTA, just one example of things that might be used to generate outbound connection that's not exactly um, normal, I would say. So, for example, Cobalt Strike uh, by default uses uh, RANDLL32 to communicate with Internet. And I mean, it's something suspicious, again, not an entirely malicious per se, but still something to be aware of. So as you can see, the event was found, so MSHTA was actually communicating with our command and control server. And yeah, you can see other events, some probably are for previous tests using Cobalt Strike uh, or things like that. But yeah, Alfie. Please take over whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay, let's wait for that to come back on. Yeah. So essentially, exactly as Ricardo said, there's an opportunity there for um, event ID three. 
Um, so if they've got a network connection coming from an MSHCA, then there, there's there's an opportunity to, to investigate that further. One thing I think is, is probably been mentioned already when it comes to MSHDA files is that when you kind of take this at a very kind of micro scale and try and expand it up to an enterprise scale, um, there's always an example that you didn't expect. Um, so when it comes to MSHDAs, for example, we thought, you know, I sort of remember doing this on a, a corporate environment and finding that MSHDA was used as an updater um, for a certain kind of printer driver. So we started looking for that and of course we found you know tons of the stuff all over the place so it, it's that kind of thing just to be wary of if the, of course with any kind of detection logic as you try it out you make your hypothesis and then you kind of extend that and see what you can find um so going from there actually just one question that i can see on the qa which is, is a good example of exactly what we're talking about so we mentioned here that in the first lab we're using covenant um and the, the question is essentially, could you use Metasploit or any other framework for that? And the, the answer is yes, exactly right. Um, what we're showing here could be done with any um, kind of C2 framework, and it's all kind of the case of how you package that up um, so that it, it evades detection. And what we're going to see now is a perfect example of how you can really take what we've seen from the first two labs and really get it quite <laughs> quite convoluted for the purposes of evading uh, kind of mail filtering and, and, and web filtering techniques. So, Let's go a bit further then. So Operation Cobalt Kitty. So as we said, this is a, um, essentially a, there's a cyber reason write up. You can see in the bottom left, it's linked down there. Um, and it's a really, really interesting piece of work that covers exactly how they achieved um, what they did. Um, and our hope is that as you go through this, you're going to see obvious instances where the detection principles that we've talked about in the first two labs are going to come into play. So I'm going to pass instantly back <laughs> to Ricardo to do all the hard work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So briefly, uh, through a, at a really high level, what Operation Cobalt Kitty was doing to obtain an initial access, uh, uh, they were using a Word document with a malicious macro inside. So what this malicious macro uh, did was actually creating a scheduled task um, on the victim machine. Um, using the default Windows SJ task binary. Um, what that binary did, um, so the, yeah, you now you can see that in the slides. Uh, so what scheduled task, the scheduled task was actually spawning MSHDA, as we saw in the Quadic example, uh, in order to retrieve a remote stager. Um, and that stager was just the first one or oh, like three different chains in order to finally uh, execute PowerShell and in memory uh, launch Cobalt Strike Beyond. Um, we're going to use Cobalt Strike like as I, as I said before, we tried as much as possible to use open source framework, but this time uh, we thought that using the exact same software used by the actors was something quite interesting. Um, so Cobalt Strike is a commercial product. Uh, of course, but it's still quite uh, funny to see in action. So yeah, I would say we should just jump on the demo if everything works, which is not always the case. Yeah, I can say that. Great. So this is uh, for those who never use Cobalt Strike. This is the management uh, panel. Uh, so what we did, and it wasn't shown in this video, is to create a listener. Again, all the steps are documented quite thoroughly. So the first thing that we're going to do is to create a scripted web delivery, which is a PowerShell launcher, quite similar to the one that we use in the first example. So as you can see, the classic IX function download string. So for SOC analysts, this should be quite standard. We're just taking out the PowerShell.exe command because we want to add an obfuscation layer. So while we're doing this, uh, it just to make analysis a bit more difficult. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to use the invoke obfuscation framework, which is a framework used to obfuscate, obviously, PowerShell code and we're using this very specific framework because that's the one used by Operation Cobalt Kitty as well and this again is open source and you can try that yourself. The cool thing about Invoke Obfuscation 
is that you can apply multiple iteration of very specific transformation to a PowerShell command uh, in order to make the resulting script quite unreadable and sometimes can bypass some really basic signature checks. So as you can see here, we're using the set script lock uh, command to, with the um, PowerShell snippet that Cobalstrike generated for us. Uh, now we're going to apply some transformation and seeing the result, that's the resulting PowerShell command after going through the first iteration. We can apply multiple times to make a string look funnier. And yeah, when we are happy with the results, we can take it back. Again, all the steps are documented in the uh, labs post, and I encourage you to try this type of stuff on your own. So we that's the resulting thing, which is a bit strange, as you can see, and we're going to save that as mashoff.jpg. So I'm using this quite shady naming convention uh, because that's the exact naming that was actually used uh, by Operation Cobalt Kit 2. So that was the first stager, and we are actually going to take a look at the second one. So as I said, when we were talking about the scheduled task that was using MSHTA to retrieve a remote content that eventually is going to spawn PowerShell. So that's the remote content. Uh, so that's an SCT file. You don't necessarily need to understand exactly what is it, uh, but basically it's just an XML file that can contain JavaScript code, as you can see here. And this snippet is taken from the uh, Red Canary Invoke Atomic Red Team framework, which I highly encourage you to try on your own. So you see that the PowerShell.ex it's always there and the the only thing that we change the url part is the one that we're going to host just right now so we have the scc file we have the microsoft.jpg file now we need to expose them to the victim clearly somehow and in order to do that we're going to use the cobalt strike built-in http server and again maybe other framework don't expose the same functionality, uh, but you can do that with really any type of web framework. Um, yeah, we're just testing access. So just to see if we can actually reach the payloads. Uh, you can use Apache, Nginx, really whatever you like. So the the name of the SCC file is Microsoft FTP.jpg. And again, we're testing. And yes, it's exposed correctly. And as you can see, PowerShell is going to, read to fetch the content of the other um, script that we just hosted. It's a bit convoluted, I know. So now it's really the last part of this attack chain. So you might recognize this syntax uh, from the examples before. So this is a VBA code. Um, so what it's doing is you, it's calling the um, scheduled task Windows binary uh, and it's going to create a new task. So command is quite complex, uh, but the most interesting part here is like this slash create, of course, for creating a new task. Uh, the SC minute and MO15, which means that this task is going to be executed every 15 minutes. Um, the, the task name is Windows Error Voting, and again, this is the naming convention used by attackers. And the task action is what actually is going to be executed um, from the task. So we're going to execute, execute MSHTA and this JavaScript snippet is going to fetch the SCC file that we previously hosted and it's going to execute it. So what's going to happen? MSHTA is going to download the SCC file. It's going to execute that. 
the SCT file is going to spawn PowerShell and the whole chain hopefully should work. I mean, I know it works because this is not like them. <laughs> <laughs> so we just copy the macro code in the BBA editor. I am just going to run the code. I don't want to save the file. And now just to show you in the task scheduler um, manager within Windows, you can see that Windows error reporting was actually created. Uh, and the action is MSHDA, blah, blah, blah. So instead of waiting 15 minutes, that will be quite awkward. We're going to execute the task manually. And yeah, if we go back to Cobalt Strike, we actually have a shell back. So just to repeat the process like we did before, let's analyze uh, what actually happened on the endpoint. So as you can see here, sysmon event ID 1, MSHDA, um, that was um, from the scheduled task. Um, and as you can see, the argument is JavaScript and all the things that, obviously the, this type of stuff is obvious now because we created the payload, but think about from a black box perspective, we're just analyzing this type of stuff without knowing how the payload was created. So this is the other interesting part, a network connection event. And yeah, if we proceed with the events, another event ID one, and this is from PowerShell being spawned by MSHTA. Again, quite, quite dodgy, I would say. So yeah, pretty much that was the Cobalt Kitty initial access uh, strategy. I hope that it was clear <laughs> because I, I reckon it's not, it's not the easiest. It's not the easiest. No, I think it's, it's, it's convoluted by design, right? So some of the things yeah. that they're doing there are intentionally designed to, to kind of hide their tracks or kind of detain some of this stuff. So a good example of that is our, uh, our word process, which is spawning our scheduled task or creating the scheduled task, which then isn't going to instantly create a network connection like we've seen before. Um, and that, that's the kind of thing, obviously, they're trying to do to make this as convoluted as possible and make it harder to kind of join the dots. Um, so uh, going back to the kind of the events we've got here, there's at least three detection opportunities, probably quite a few more, actually. Uh, the first one is going to be that that spawning of the scheduled task from, from uh, Microsoft Word. Um, so again, we're looking at our, our create process creation events, event ID one. Um, one of the questions in the QA was around, yes, we are using Sys1 here, um, but as Ricardo said earlier, there are, as, as uh, quite rightly, there are a number of ways to do the same thing. So it might be that process creation events are exposed to you through an EDR as a completely proprietary kind of format. Um, it might be that you can use um, enhanced process auditing to, I think it's a 4688, I think is, is, is the same event essentially um, that you can use for the same purpose. Um, and then moving down then schedule task. So that's an event ID we haven't seen before. So that's a 4698 um, where our new schedule task has been created. Now it's probably worth mentioning here actually um, something that's, that's, that's a super valuable resource. Um, so what we've got here is an example um, of a Sigma rule uh, and Sigma is essentially a community driven project um, from Florian Roth that allows us to translate our detection logic into a way that's essentially usable by everyone. So what you're seeing here is, is the Sigma rule and then using Sigma converters, um, you can change this into the format that suits you. So be that Elastic, be that Splunk, be that even uh, PowerShell, which is one of the things we'll use in, in one of the lab scripts. You could take this logic and then apply that to whatever stack you're using to do your detection. So that's super useful for essentially, you know, not replicating, you know, the same activities everyone else is doing, not reinventing the wheel when it comes to detecting this stuff. Um, an additional question I saw as well was around how attackers can try and evade um, detection and kind of what you should do from a detection strategy point of view. Well, this is a great example of kind of applying, like if you've seen um, David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain that covers like everything from IPs and hashes at the bottom right through to TTPs at the very top. So, so essentially your ability to detect TTPs is much more painful, as it says, to, to attackers than a given IP address or a hash. If you can you know, easily identify a known bad hash through kind of threat intel feeds or something that your EDR provides out of the box, 
Um, that's going to be really great for a campaign that's widespread. But as soon as you know the attacker changes the binaries that they're using or changes their technique, they can evade that and they go again and that process repeats itself. But if you can accurately stop them at a TTP level or detect them at a TTP level, that's the kind of thing that's going to cause them the most pain. So it's a blend of both of those things from specific IOCs right through to more general TTP. So good example of what you can investigate here uh, is a Sigma rule designed to spot rare scheduled tasks. So if you look at the kind of, I guess, two thirds of the way down, you can see event ID 4698, which we just mentioned. Um, and what this is saying essentially is let's take all of the scheduled task creation events from the last seven days um, and let's count the, count them by task name where the task name has only occurred um, less than five times. So obviously those thresholds are subject to change. You could do with that what you will. Um, but what we're looking for here is somewhere where across our estate with all the symmetry we have, there are scheduled tasks that are very, very rare. Um, you can use other things here. So things like um, OS query. I think that's a, an open source tool that lets you do a very similar kind of investigation. Um, but Sigma is super useful for both TTP level and for IOC level. So I'd highly recommend you go and look at that and look through some of the various um, detections in there and see if you can apply them to your own stack. Um, going back to our detections then, third one, our MSHDA um, that's downloaded content from the internet. So again, event ID three. Um, and then from that, we then have um, that spawning PowerShell. And then obviously again, event ID one. Uh, in the bottom left, I've referred to it a few times, is that LOL Bass project. So, we talked about lol bins living off the land binaries. Well, that bottom left link there is an awesome resource for li living off the land binaries and scripts. Um, that's what lol bash stands for. And basically you can go there, you can look for a given functionality that you're looking for. So for example, if you're looking for kind of an application whitelisting bypass, a download or an executor, you can see which Windows binaries, which scripts, which libraries you can use um, to achieve that effect. So they may already be on the disk, just like MSHDA and just that scheduled task are. So super cool to look at that. And then the last of our labs then, um, lab three or three and a half or five, four, um, is an Excel 4.0 macro using shell code. So this is going to take things a little bit further and hopefully we'll see some of the limitations of the detection strategies you've already discussed and how we might have to change our tack if we're going to try and find them. Um, so again, I'll pass back to Ricardo for the last one. Yeah, so as Afi was mentioning, we're going to create an Excel 4.0 macro that's going to execute a shell code. So what is a shellcode? Just to start, a shellcode for those who are not familiar is just a, a small and self-contained piece of code that you can use to uh, download a stager from a remote location and execute in memory, or it can be uh, the full implant code. But the keyword is self-contained. Self it doesn't need external dependencies and things like that. Um, we're going to execute this shellcode uh, using the Windows 32 APIs um, embedded within an Excel 4.0 macro. So why we're using Excel 4.0 macros? That's a super legacy feature within Excel. Uh, however, it's gaining a lot of popularity amongst threat actors and red teamers as well. And the reason is quite simple. It, that's because EDR and AV engines, apparently they have a lot of troubles uh, parsing the um, that specific type of code. Uh, we're not going to create that manually, but we're going to use um, a framework, again, an open source framework, uh, which is Sharpshooter that was developed by MDSEC. Um, so as, a, as I mentioned, we're going to use uh, Windows 32 APIs to execute shellcode. Uh, and these specific APIs, uh, you can see them highlighted here. It, they're like virtual alloc, write process memory, and create thread. Now, you don't need to be a Windows internal expert, because uh, I'm not either. Uh, but to a really high level, what this does is just allocating memory in the current process space, writing something into the newly allocated memory. And in this case, it's a shell code and creating a thread that's going to point to the allocated memory space. So that's going to execute uh, our shell code. And the one that you can see on the right is just the skeleton uh, of the macro 4.0 that Sharpshooter use uh, to uh, generate the payload. So without wasting too much time trying to share my screen, Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, okay. So 
this time we're going to use uh, to use another framework, uh, and this time we're going to use Betasploit, which is uh, even more popular. Um, so the first step, as always, is to generate the payload, and in this case, we're going to use the MSF Venom utility from the Metasploit framework to do that. The interesting bit here is that we're going to use uh, a payload that will use HTTPS as a transmission transport mechanism, and the specific payload in this um, case, it's called Metapreter, uh, which is just the Metasploit specific implant. Uh, it has a lot of functionality, it's quite cool and should be flagged by nearly every AV in the world. So just to give you overview, that's that's the raw shell code. So it, it, it looks like random stuff, but it's actually the hex form of assembly code. So we generated our shellcode in a file called shellcode.bin uh, and we're going to pass the shellcode to the sharpshooter framework. You can see the options are quite easy. So the row SC file is just the uh, binary of the shellcode. Uh, minus minus payload um, and the value is uh, SLK or silk, which is the type, the default extension used uh, within Excel to execute macro 4.0. We don't need to do anything else. And yeah, the file is actually generated in output test.silk. And yeah, it's a bit complex, but yeah, it, it looks like the skeleton the way we've seen before. The only additional part is the uh, see at the bottom. It's all the uh, it, it's basically the shell code that we added. But the interesting bit, so the API functions, virtual alloc, write process memory, and create thread are still there. So before jumping into the execution, we need to configure Metasploit to accept connections from the victim machine. And to do that, we're going to use the auxiliary. Um, sorry, multi-handler module. The important part here is just to configure the exact same payload as we did with MSF Venom. The other options, the host and the port are pretty much the same. And yeah, we're going to use the exploit keyword to start the listener. So let's jump into the victim host and execute the test.silk file. We enable content and yeah, I mean, it looks it looks strange, okay? Because that's because the that's the sharpshooter default behavior. So by default, it doesn't hide um, the workbook um, where all the malicious code is stored. Uh, but I mean, threat actors are getting pretty good at hiding uh, things within Excel Office and things like that. Uh, and again, you you, you can hide spreadsheets and still have the code to be executed after the user enabled contents anyways. Uh, but that's just for the sake of the demonstration. And as you can see, we actually obtained that connection back. And just to prove that we have some level of access, get QID is the command to print the username. And yeah, I have a shell on my own box. So, this time we're not going to analyze Windows event logs like we did before, uh, because uh, as we will see later, there aren't many. Uh, so the thing we're going to do is a bit more low level. So we're going to use the dump IT software to do to per extract the raw memory from the compromised machine. And again, this is something that uh, your EDR product might exposed to you in some form like I've seen some products uh, that give that kind of ability to to, to users. Um, we move the dump the memory dump into the analysis box and we're going to use the open source framework called volatility uh, to perform some really basic memory forensic. So usually we start with image info just to um, trying to identify the profile, the memory profile 
uh, of the box that we're trying to analyze. And after we find it, we that's what I usually do. And I mean, uh, your workflow might vary. Uh, it's used the PS3 command just to list all the running processes um, in this visual way that lets you understand all the parent and child process relationship. We can see that Excel was actually used, but nothing that you was spawned from Excel. So no PowerShell, no SCA task or things like that. So we need to do something a bit harder this time. Uh, we're going to use the plugin called Malfind. So what Malfind does, it scan all the processes and look for signs of process injection activity. Um, and it's going to use different type of indicators um, and we're going to discuss just a few of them like now. So as you can see, Malfine identified something suspicious within the Excel.exe uh, memory space. And uh, in this specific case, the memory protection uh, of a specific memory space within Excel had uh, it, it, it was weird, OK? So usually when you allocate memory um, using low level APIs, uh, you can configure that memory to be execute, uh, read or write or combination of these. Uh, but when a, when a memory space is configured to be all of them, so read, write and execute, it's something, I mean, it's malicious per se again, and you're going to find so many cases uh, where like normal products do the same, but it's something that, yeah, it, it looks dodgy. Uh, but the dodgiest thing here is that if you look at the first two bytes of the address, the, the memory space that was identified by Malfine, you see the MZ bytes. So for those who don't know, MZ is the uh, are the magic bytes um, for the PE, the portable executable file. So EXEs and DLLs, they all start with these two bytes. Um, so, so Malfine identified a memory space which had some weird uh, memory protection and also it start with the magic bytes. So it's definitely something weird. So what we're doing now is take the address and analyze a bit deeper. So what uh, I think that I didn't mention is that Malfind also gives you the opportunity to dump on disk uh, all the memory portion that he identifies as malicious. So we take the address that we want to analyze and we can see the raw memory of that. But yeah, a lot of stuff, um, but <laughs> interestingly, you can see two quite dodgy things. So like on the bottom, you can see a user agent, which yeah, could be, uh, but also uh, you will also see um, the HTTP uh, 192.168. So that's the IP address of my command and control server. And that's clearly something a bit dodgy. So another thing that we're going to do, this is like super simple uh, triage and I appreciate it's not super comprehensive, but like just analyzing the strings uh, could give you interesting results. Um, so for, for example, here we see a few different interesting stuff. So the reflective loader key, uh, keyword, uh, it's something used uh, within reflective DLL. So Metasploit is packed within, uh, sorry, Metapreter is packed within a reflective DLL, um, which is just a DLL with some specific properties. Uh, you don't need to actually understand exactly what's happening under the hood, but I assure you that's quite dodgy uh, to see <laughs> in an Excel process at least. Uh, and you can see other functions like uh, NTQ APC, APC thread and also SC debug privilege. Uh, if you're familiar with this type of attacks, you, you might recognize some of them. Uh, but yeah, Alfie. Yep, yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, obvious things we saw there is there's a lack of um, 
child process being created that we can kind of inspect and look at as, a, as an anomaly. Um, and that's obviously done by virtue of the way that it's injecting code into the Excel process itself and using that create thread essentially to run it within Excel rather than having to spawn off into a new process. Um, and then again, if, if you monitor Excel, you'll find that it communicates um, frequently with external addresses anyway. Um, and so there are opportunities here that you could use. So, for example, the, the likelihood is that the majority of your Excel traffic is going to be probably to Microsoft services rather than to the open Internet of you know, miscellaneous sites. Um, so there is a chance to kind of base like that and find anomalies. But then as with all of this kind of, you know, you know, like a fight between blue and red is if you start looking for that kind of stuff, things like FSecure C3. So there's a link to that in the bottom left um, allows you to talk essentially establish a command and control channel over um, Microsoft services. So there's a good example of things that attackers are doing and, and ways that we can emulate that um, that make it just a little bit more difficult every time to, to spot these kind of things. Um, so what we've seen there is a few different, I guess there's a few different angles you can take for this. So the first one is something we haven't covered in too much detail here, which is actually that boundary between the outside internet and your corporate network. So both in terms of mail and in terms of web filtering. So it might be that these kind of payloads, things like sharpshooter, just kind of default payloads um, are likely going to be picked up by your mail gateway anyway. And building a signature yourself for that kind of stuff as it passes through your mail gateway is probably unnecessary and it also has a huge amount of risk because of course all of this is possible because we leave a door open to receive emails to do kind of legitimate business right so um building a signature that's going to flag on something that turns out to be business critical when it comes to email traffic um is, is a dangerous game to play and that's exactly what attackers are capitalizing on and that's exactly what you need to be wary of with that um if i skip on i think you'd have a slide for that but you can see some of that stuff taking place there so if we see these obvious api calls within our, our macro um then we know that something fishy is going on here and there's a great tool there um ole tools you can use to essentially strip out this and view um, the raw macro without having to detonate it in a dynamic sandbox you can just do it as a static analysis and see some of the stuff taking place um there's a few other techniques like vba stomping here that again just make things more difficult um but we can cover off those in in, in a subsequent uh, workshop um API monitoring. So this is something that is very much in the realms of EDR. So um, essentially what we're seeing here is those API calls that we consider suspect. So Ricardo started doing a roll call of all of those different ones from Q user APC thread to creating thread here and create, create remote thread is another one that deals with remote process threads. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that you can look for and find anomalies. In addition to that, we've also got um, the page permissions that you're seeing there. So we talked about execute read write. Um, if you see instances there where we had our portable executable header and our memory permissions and those in conjunction, you're probably going to look at something that's that's a bit dodgy in Ricardo's words. But again, attackers could do things to make that more difficult. So as an example, um, you can dynamically change the permissions on the memory that you're working with. So you can allocate it with read write. Um, you can make your you basically write your shellcode into memory and then change it to execute read so that there's never a memory section that's using execute read write and is therefore exposed as it were. Um, so the volume of data we're talking about here is is obviously huge when you consider enterprise scale and all the various API calls that are going on legitimately under the hood. So that's a um, a big thing and that's why attackers are moving here because it is so difficult to do at scale. And then lastly, we saw using volatility here um, we can inspect our Excel process. We can find details of our user agent and, our, and the, the IP address that we're talking back to. Um, of course, doing memory dumps of your entire estate and using volatility, volatility on, on those is going to be a real pain. That's going to be quite a big day's work. So this again falls within the realms of your EDR um, to kind of do this using memory scanning um, and, and kind of take the take the load off and do it do it that way. So there's just an example of the ways in which you could detect this within um, within processes. So a lot of stuff there. I appreciate it. it's dead on five. So I apologize running over ever so slightly. Um, so we covered quite a few different things there and we did it quite quickly. So again, the, the video for this is going to recording is going to be available afterwards. The lab guides have got far more detail in terms of how you can do all of these things yourself. And obviously um, feel free to reach out and ask questions on those. But we've created a few different maldocs using a variety of different techniques. We've seen opportunities to defend um, by detecting based on parent process and child process relationships. We've seen establishing network connections. We've seen suspicious use of Windows API's. We've seen some encoded PowerShell. And one thing we didn't mention there is 
something I've seen before, two things actually. First is um, you can often get some processing done on those logs to get the length of the PowerShell command, and that in itself could be an indicator that you can tag um, and then add that into your detection and kind of be more sure that something is going on here that might be odd. You'll see encoded PowerShell across your estate most likely based on just administrative tasks taking place. Often that's what it's used for in a legitimate sense. Um, and the second one is I've also seen some EDR products that block uh, invoke uh, expression based on its proximity to invoke web request. Um, so you might actually have some preventative controls in that area that are worth looking into. Um, and then finally, memory artifacts. So obviously Ricardo, Ricardo took us through using volatility to spot our um, sharp sheet of payload buried within our, our Excel process. Uh, and then finally, from just from a, um, a more kind of hands-on perspective, we got to play with Covenant, um, Coadic, Metasploit, and we saw some Cobalt Strike as well. So next time, it's going to be Anarch taking the wheel for this one. So that's July the 1st, 2020, obviously. Uh, and he's doing code execution um, and persistence. So he's going to take us a, a step further down the kill chain uh, and look at what an attacker is going to do once they've obtained um, that initial foothold and how they can maintain a presence there and what they can do to, to further advance down the kill chain towards their objective. If you haven't already, there's a link there. Um, so if you can sign up for, for the additional ones, then, then go for it. That'd be great. Um, and then we'll stick around just to go, go through some questions. I've been trying to answer some of the Q&A as it's been coming through. Um, so we'll just take a look at some of those now that are left. Um, yeah, I think that we have a couple of questions uh, around <laughs> evasion. Success. Yeah, go ahead, take that one first, take that one first. Um, yeah, so a couple of people are asking um, that the payload that we that we showed are like are picked up by AV and EDRs. And that's true. Um, and I mean, the detection aspect, it's something that probably we're going to tackle in a separate webinar because um, <laughs> it would take ages uh, to say everything about that. Uh, just to give you a, a really high level overview, uh, these frameworks, frameworks can be customized a lot. And the fact that, for example, Covenant is open source, it means that you can change its code, you can change the profile uh, used, so it, his behaviors in terms of network connectivity uh, and code injection and things like that. So a more advanced operator might, op might decide to modify that code or simply just take the, for example, the uh, Cobalt Strike shell code and wrap into some other custom logic. So for example, we 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 showed how to use the sharpshooter framework to generate um, uh, an injection template from a shell code, but that's something that you can do uh, with other type of language. Uh, so yeah, it's quite difficult. Yeah, so uh, that's a whole subject in itself, isn't yeah. it, in terms of just <laughs> obfuscation techniques and, and injection techniques as well. Um, something that's kind of, I guess, in vogue at the moment is, is using syscalls to basically try and bypass um, some of the user land, right, like API hooking. So as an example, um, if we were to run um, one of our samples there, so if you were trying to just rather than do it in VBA, but do it in, in another language and essentially execute that as an executable, um, the presence of those those various API calls like create create thread could in themselves trigger an alert um, and that could be you know that file could be then quarantined or whatever happens next um, and the idea is that you can use for example syscalls to basically bypass um, the AV that's attempting to hook those functions so every time something tries to create thread it can bounce into a um, AV controlled function to inspect it and if you use syscalls you can try and bypass that so it's just one of the things so there's tons of different ways to bypass that, as Ricardo said, for everything from the payload code to the traffic profile, the way that it moves around, injects payloads or injects into other processes, all of that kind of stuff is like, it's a whole nother series of workshops in itself. It's quite a, you know, a convoluted topic. And that's the reason we're still, I guess, here doing this stuff is that the permutations are kind of endless. Um, what about the success of this uh, with Windows Defender? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, Windows Defender is awesome. Uh, so, and, and it's the bane of my life for many kind of offensive engagements that we do. Um, so it, it's when it comes to the default payloads and a lot of these things or the default behaviors, kind of the well-trodden path with some of the, even down to the API techniques that we, we've seen or the API calls to um, allocate and inject memory. Um, that kind of stuff is, is, is scrutinized by Defender. Um, and it's 
it's worth having the detection in place for even the basic out of the box stuff because it just raises the bar. So if someone um, can use one that we always refer to, I guess, is Empire. And Empire is like discontinued now. I know it's been taken on by another company as to maintain it, but essentially it's been deprecated for a long time. And Covenant has been seen as the, the, the kind of evolution of that from PowerShell to .NET. Um, but people still use it. It still works. And whilst it works, it's kind of a profit and loss. Like I'm not going to go and use my custom um, custom frameworks and use my, my, my ODAs or anything if I can use Empire um, in an environment that has, you know, suitably low maturity that I can get away with it. So, you know, it, it's covering all of those things from um, the basic out of the box stuff. So you can look for IOCs. This is where things like um, like Yara rules and stuff comes into play. But straight all the way up the food chain to, to the TTP level and understanding like if you can you can reliably detect the behavior. So spawning the different processes or the various injection technique, then you're going to do a lot more damage to attackers than at a hash level, like an IOC level. But the spectrum is is fast and having coverage of all of those things ideally is, is going to be the best way. But um, yeah, Defender is really good and it's going to cause a lot of trouble when it comes to doing these. <laughs> if you do these in a lab with Defender turned on, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> Um, for how long the lab will be live. Yeah, so all, all the blogs are up now, um, so you can use those at your leisure. They're not going to come down anytime soon, um, and the recording will be up for a long time as well, so you can you can access that as well. What I'll do after this, when we get the recording link, is I'll stick the link in the blogs as well, so you can easily refer back to that if you need to while you, while you start um, one of the labs. But all four of the things we see in here, from the PowerShell um, uh, Excel spreadsheet right through to the injecting shell code with Excel, is all going to be um, covered in those those blogs if you haven't found them already um yeah okay well thanks again for joining guys uh and i hopefully we'll see you for the next one next week